Welcome back to 25 Minute Fizz. Today, we're talking about exercise programming. In other words, putting together workout programs. We talked in the five minute fizz section about the seven modifiable variables. So in other words, you're deciding to write a new workout program for yourself or for a client. What are the things that I can change that would alter the adaptation or the result that I get out of my plan? So those seven modifiable variables, and we'll talk about those in separate videos. But in this particular talk, we want to focus on that first modifiable variable, which is exercise choice. In other words, known as exercise selection. So how do I pick the right exercise? Well, if we took our basic template, right, and we decided to work our, our, write our new workout program, and if you sat down on your computer and you opened up Microsoft Excel or, or Word or whatever you use, and you sat down and it looked something like this, and you said, okay, my new workout program, I'm so excited, I'm gonna get jacked up or, or lose a bunch of weight or whatever I want. Okay, what am I gonna do? Day one. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, well, I know, let's see, squats are important, so maybe I'll squat. Okay, uh, then I guess um, I'll maybe do some more squats. And then, yeah, you know, to hell with it, I'll, I'll, I'll just pay a trainer. All right, or I'll get a program online. Well, that's usually what it looks like. And what, this ha what happens or what causes this is poor planning or a lack of planning. So what I want to do in this video is talk about those 11 things that you can use to help decide your exercise choice. Now, if you come back and follow up with the 55 minute video, I'm going to go into detail about how to actually do this, what big things to consider and how to pick your specific exercises. But for this example, I'm just going to give you some things to consider. I'm going to walk you through those explanations a little bit about what they mean and, and how they can might alter your exercise choices. So I know sometimes when you're writing these workout programs or if you've ever paid one and got one from a coach or, or from a trainer, you feel like it's this magical sorcery or there's this magical book somewhere they're consulting and all of a sudden they sh you, know, you pay them and they go away for two weeks and all of a sudden they show back up with this perfect recipe and every single thing is, is dialed. Well, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I'm hoping in this video we can demystify that a little bit so you understand the rationale that most good coaches are using or maybe lack thereof. Right. So what I did is I put together an avatar and I just totally made someone up and we'll call this person Randy. So I want to walk you through how I would actually consider what I would consider with our person Randy here and how we would put together his program or how we would select his exercises. So let's say we have a sample day here we've, or we've decided for whatever reason on six different exercises, overhead squat, deadlift, rows, glute bridges, etc. Well, what we need to understand is, and I talked a little bit about this in the, in the five minute fizz episode, is what separates a coach that doesn't know what they're doing, but still might make the right decision from a coach that really understands everything, is if they can walk through every single one of these exercises and defend and justify exactly why they picked that exercise and more specifically why they picked that exact variation. So if we look through on uh, number one, exercise number one, and we said, okay, uh, looks like I have program to do overhead squats today. We should have a rationale that said something maybe like this, and I'm literally just making this up as I'm going. Uh, maybe we wanted to get some light leg work in. We wanted to also work the shoulders in the back position. Okay, we wanted to uh, also not worry about going extremely heavy or not worry about going to maximal fatigue because we're going to do those on a separate workout. Well, overhead squat is great for all those things because you can't overhead squat that much physical weight. So although it's a heavy for you relative to the movement, it's not very heavy to your legs. So maybe I pick an overhead squat on a day that I know, hey, actually the next workout coming is a heavy leg squat day. So I don't want to, I want to do a little legs today, but I don't want to crush my legs. I'm more worried about maybe developing posture or shoulder position or doing a complex coordinated movement. Now, we could go through this with every one of those six exercises, but we don't want to. Right? We'll go through actually that in more detail. Again, if your coach can't answer in that detail or better, they might make the right choices, but they really don't understand what they're doing. And you should ask. It's not disrespectful to question them. Now, you've got to pay attention to your tone, but it's actually a good, a good advice for an intern, if you're interning or if you are a coach or an athlete, to ask. Hey coach, I noticed that we're doing overhead squats today. I'm just wondering, why are we doing with the dumbbells as opposed to barbells? 
Or why are we doing it in this stance as opposed to this stance? I'm trying to learn, right? I'm, I'm, I really like, or I'm excited about this stuff. I'm trying to help understand. If you use that tone, you're usually gonna get a better response. If the coach knows what they're doing, they're gonna give you some really good insight. If they don't, that'll give you some insight as well. What we're really trying to get at here is answering one very basic question, which is why specifically did I make that exercise selection with all of the variables that come with it? So why did we do this version of the squat or this version of the ab exercise? Or why did we grab this implement versus this implement, a kettlebell versus a dumbbell? Why are we using a band here? Why are we doing this one on one leg coach versus two legged? Why are we doing this with a partner? Or why am I holding my knee in this position as opposed to that position? Because every single variation you make alters a little bit of the exercise. If we look at these two exercises, again, over here on this side of the screen is your normal, that overhead squat position with your classic barbell. And over here is actually just a modified overhead squat. So in this particular case, I'm using a kettlebell. I'm only doing it one arm. I'm doing it also on one leg. And I'm standing on a goofy medicine ball. And if you're wondering, yes, I did complete that all the way down and back up. Well, it's not that one of these is better than the other one. In fact, if you have a coach that says that, or if you are currently saying that, shame on you, right? There are no such things as good or bad exercises. There are no exercises that are better or worse than others. It all depends on the exact situation. All we have is exercises. Exercises give us good things and exercises don't do some things. We need to understand all those idiosyncrasies so that we can understand our selection a little bit better. So in the case of the right over here, uh, the, the one armed on the medicine ball thing, that would be a better exercise selection than the barbell version if I was trying to work on, say, unilateral stability, right? So this is stability on my right arm and my right leg. I'm not gonna get that on the, with the other picture because by, the, by doing it bilaterally, meaning two arms and two legs at the same time, I can use my other side to fix any deficiencies I have on one side. So if I did this exercise over here, the one arm, one leg thing, and I was able to do five repetitions in good, with good technique with 50 pounds, and then I went to my left side and did the exact same exercise on the other side, and I could only do 30 pounds for three repetitions, I would immediately identify I've got some sort of asymmetry between my sides. All right, so that would be one of the benefits of doing the overhead squat in this fashion. Now, a downside could be, how much weight can I possibly load? Do you think that's going to sufficiently tax the strength of my glutes or my hamstrings? Probably not. In fact, I, it might be simply so complex that the technique of it limits all productivity or most of the productivity, especially in terms of strength. Right? So again, every exercise has a strength and it has a weakness. We need to be able to identify that and consider every aspect when we're making our exercise selection. So let's jump into these things a little bit more detail. Now, last time I gave you the overview of the 11 things I said you, you should consider. This is not everything you should ever consider, but I think this is a very good starting ground. So let's dive into these. I'll go through them and give you some specific examples. Number one, what's the goal of the sport or the activity? You really need to understand your client's desires or the, the reason you're putting the program together. That will help you make your exercise selection. So if I am programming in this example for our fictional character, Randy, and Randy is interested in competing in the sport of weightlifting or Olympic weightlifting, well, the barbell overhead squat is probably the normal the, or the better exercise choice because that's more specific to that person's goal or sport or activity. If I'm interested in simply becoming uh, more well-rounded or more athletic or I want to just have some fun in the gym or maybe I'm interested in gymnastics or maybe I'm a practitioner of parkour, maybe in that case, the one foot, one arm medicine ball squat is more related to the goal of the sport or the activity. But let's consider that first. Another thing to consider, your proper energy systems. Now you'll have to go back and watch some different videos to understand what those things are. But does the exercise allow me to train in the proper energy system? Okay, so if we took our one foot, one armed squatting example, how many repetitions can I possibly do? Probably not very many, and I probably can't do it that, that heavy unless I'm exceptionally talented, which for the record, I'm not, right? Not in that exercise. 
So if I was trying to pick an exercise and I was trying to work my lactate system or I was trying to get some severe conditioning in or maybe even aerobic endurance, steady state conditioning, something like that, that would probably be a very poor exercise choice because the technical limitations don't allow me to train in the proper energy system, right? Now, if I were to do something again, like I wanted to work my lactate system or work anaerobic, um, any anaerobic energy system, well, the overhead barbell squat's probably a little bit better because it allows me to train in that system where I can actually feel confident, where I can push the conditioning and push the pace while not feeling like I'm, I'm nervous and physically scared that I'm gonna get hurt, so I'm focusing more on that than I am getting tired, so I reserve and hold myself back. Okay, so does the exercise selection allow me to go as hard as I need to go, or as easy as I need to go, depending on the exact energy system we're trying to work into? Number three, sport specific. Now, I'll certainly have a different video for this term because it is horribly misunderstood. It does not mean it has to look like your sport. All this simply means is, will the skill reasonably transfer over to the sport or the activity or the competition the person's doing? All right. Again, just because it looks more or, or less like it doesn't mean it's more sport specific. So for example, a common misunderstanding here is take the sport or the activity of running. Well, you may know that running is almost always one foot at a time. So in other words, you never have two feet on the ground at the same time with running. People use that to then say all of your training should be done on one leg. In other words, you should never do this exercise over here because you'll never be on two legs when you run. Well, that's probably pretty short-sighted and a, a fundamental misunderstanding of exercise physiology and strength and conditioning, really. But nonetheless, it is true, your exercises need to have some specificity towards the sport you're, you're competing in. Number four. Muscles involved. Now, we'll talk later in separate talks about the difference between programming by muscle split. So in other words, I do my biceps today and my triceps tomorrow and, and things like that versus whole body movements. But we do need to consider what muscles are involved. What muscle is probably the primary mover? What muscles is the tertiary or secondary movers or, or the tertiary or, or later down the road? What am I trying to use? What should I be using? What did I use yesterday? What am I going to be using tomorrow so that I don't overuse a muscle unless that's the goal, right? So we want to consider that. We, that'll also help us pay attention to things like overall balance. So I may not realize, oh my gosh, I've just done five exercises this week that are actually pec major, and I haven't done anything for pec minor. And matter of fact, I haven't done anything for my posterior shoulder rotator cuff. Mm, I'm kind of grinding the wheel only on one side. I'm not necessarily balancing it on the other. So paying attention to the muscles involved Quick example, let's say we want to do some sort of pull-up. Okay, we know we want to do some sort of pull-up, but do I do the overhand grip or do I do the chin-up supine grip? Well, that changes considerably. Specifically, when you rotate and move your hands this way, I now tend to use my bicep a lot more. I need to consider that if I know that tomorrow is a heavy bicep day or tomorrow is a heavy deadlift day, which the deadlift also can tend to, especially if you have a supinated grip in the deadlift, can tend to put a lot of strain on the bicep. Don't believe me? There's been plenty of strong men who've torn their biceps in half during a deadlift. So we need to consider all of those things involved, even though the pull-up is traditionally a back exercise, depending on the variation I'm using, how wide my grip is, where my stance is, that can use or turn off different muscles. So we want to pay attention to the entire picture, entire picture or entire package of not only the exercise as a general statement, but very specifically the exact type or form or method I'm using to get the exercise and how that's gonna affect the muscles involved. Number five, you should also probably consider the injury status of the individual. So I may have a great plan to do some one-armed kettlebell swings today and the athlete shows up and says, ah, man, my wrist is killing me. Okay, well, if I understand what I was trying to get out of that one-armed dumbbell swing, I can now modify the exercise to accommodate the injury, but still get the primary adaptation. So for example, if I was using that exercise as a method to, let's say, simply work the back, that's all I cared about, is I wanted to work the glutes in the low back. Well, maybe I can now move to a dumbbell or a barbell deadlift, 
and I'll actually give the athlete some straps so I take some pressure off the wrist because I wasn't really concerned about training the grip or the forearm that day. Conversely, if, if the purpose of my one-arm kettlebell swing was to get some a little bit of glute stuff done but also get some unilateral stability of my anti-lateral flexion or lateral flexion, well then I need to come up with a way to do that without actually harming the wrist. So I'll have to modify my exercise choice. Right? Now I work a lot with combat sport athletes and, and have in the past and this is I can tell you something that is every single day you're going to have to modify that. If you don't understand exactly what you were trying to get out of your exercise selection, you have no prayer when you have to make an on the fly decision to change or alter the exercise. You don't know what you were shooting for. So when you have obstacles show up in the way, you have no idea how to modify things. You're simply guessing. It won't take long, actually, honestly, too, for your athletes to figure that out. And they'll sort of go back to the beginning with our magical potions, and then sort of like, you're just pulling stuff out of a hat. You don't really understand what you're doing here. But it, I promise you, if an athlete can show up to you and you say, hey, look, we're doing split foot, uh, one foot, foot, foot in front of the other, uh, alt contralateral bicep curls. And they go, oh, man, I can't because my left elbow is killing me. And you can immediately go, oh, okay, you know what? The purpose of the exercise was actually just to work on some stability. So you know what? We'll do the same exact exercise. I won't have you do the curl, or maybe I'll have you go to an overhead press. Now I'm still working my stability. Cool. I understood what I was programming the exercise for so I can make an alteration. And that athlete will go, oh, cool. And they'll actually say, well, well isn't that a bicep movement? Is that the, no, that's fine, coach. That's fine, athlete. That's not, we didn't care about the biceps today. We were actually doing it to work on this, and so we'll go to here, and they'll go, oh, oh, okay, sweet, awesome. And they'll have total confidence in you. So being able to work around your injury status. Number six, the movement plane, right? So am I working in the frontal, sagittal, transverse plane? Where am I working at? Am I trying to work multi-plane? Am I trying to work connection to connection? So am I trying to work rotational to vertical? What am I trying to do? So making sure, again, this is sort of similar to point number four, where we probably want to make sure that we have at least somewhat of a reasonable balance between the exercises we select so that we have an equal training in all of our movement planes. Now, if you're somebody who's simply interested in bodybuilding, maybe you don't worry about six so much. You're probably more worried about the muscles. But if you're looking for general conditioning, for health, for um, to generally feel better, uh, to, for weight loss, if you make sure you have at least a reasonable balance between all of your movement planes and probably a lot of movements that combine multiple planes, what that's going to do is allow you to train a lot more often before you develop some sort of imbalance or before you get some sort of overuse injury. All right, so paying attention to the movement planes when you're selecting your exercises is really important as well. Number seven, anthropometrics. This is kind of a fancy way of saying your own body segment lengths. So me, for example, I've got a torso about this long, right? My femur is not too big. It's very, very easy. Um, my back tends to be longer like that. It's very easy for me to squat. However, uh, a training partners of mine, a friend of mine, Doug Larson, for a long time, he's kind of the exact opposite of me. And so I tend to be very good at squatting and terrible at deadlifting, and he is great at pulling and not as good as squatting because he's got a longer femur. He's way back. His angles are better. So maybe we make a different exercise selections based on our anthropometrics. Uh, I used to work with Division I basketball players. I had a seven-footer. We had to make some modifications. That's a long waist for him to go up and down when he's doing overhead squats. Now, we still did snatch, full barbell snatch from the ground all the way down. But if we really wanted him to work and do a lot of reps, we had to modify some things later because we didn't want him to get into bad positions. All right, so again, just because you're tall doesn't mean you can't do an exercise or short people should always squat this way. You know, I've heard people say things like, hey, if you're tall, you should always sumo squat, and if you're short, you should always conventional. Well, I don't believe in any of that. I do believe, though, you should consider it. It's just not a situation where it's always or never. Oh, you're over 5'11", you automatically go do this. You're under 5'10", you automatically go do that. It's not that simple, but it is something you should consider. Moving on to number eight. And that's, ex and that's exercise progression. So in other words, are you experienced versus a novice? Are you, say, a freshman in high school versus a senior in high school, or a freshman in college versus a senior in college? What's your training history look like? So you may need to, and this is probably the one that you're going to be engaged with the most, 
but you're probably going to have to alter the exercise choices you do based on their experience level. So for example, if we take out our, our two pictures again, a novice or an inexperienced lifter might be able to pull off an overhead squat, even though it is a pretty technically difficult movement. That person is very unlikely to be able to do the one arm, one foot on a medicine ball. In fact, you may have to go even further back and you might have to go something even easier than an overhead squat and maybe something like just a basic body weight squat. All right, so you need to modify the exercise selection depending on their experience, their abilities, and what they know how to do and what they can't do. So for example, they may be very, very experienced in squatting, but they're very unexperienced in body weight movements. So even though they've been training for 10 years or they are an elite level athlete, they may be inexperienced in some other types of movements. So you may have to regress them back to their abilities within that movement category. Number nine now, as we're getting towards the end, their mobility and flexibility, of course. We want to have everyone going through full ranges of motions at all their joints, but we understand that mobility, flexibility, range of motion, however you want to call it, can be different. So we, don't, we want to make sure we're not exposing athletes or non-athletes to too much ability, too much exercise, too much movement in an unsafe environment for them. It doesn't mean we can't ever get them to a little bit of a bad position, but we want to be cognizant and careful of that. And so we may alter an exercise. So for example, if we're doing our overhead squat and somebody just can't get into good positions, we're not going to force them all the way into that overhead squat and have them doing a bunch of exercises there because we love the overhead squat because it works well for me, right? I need to pay attention to, no, no, it's not about me. It's about you or my client, right? Whenever you're writing these programs for your athletes, pay attention to what it is for them, not for you. Just because you like that exercise, it doesn't matter. You're not the one that's important here. You're not the star of the show. So make sure we modify things based on their own mobility and flexibility until we can improve it. Number 10, the need for variation. Now I'll do this one all the time. I'll do what I call my hotel workout. So a lot of times when I'm traveling, and you guys, you've done this before, where you'll go to a hotel, you get a, you wanna get a workout in, so you go down to the hotel gym. It's like usually packed away in a basement somewhere. And you kind of walk in, you slide your key card in, you open up the door and you're like, okay, what am I about to step into? And it is a crapshoot for what you get, right? So sometimes I will simply do this where I'll say, all right, I'm gonna walk into the hotel gym, my eyes are closed, I'm going to do a set of 10 of every single exercise, even piece of equipment they have in that gym. I'm gonna go in a big circle, whatever order those things are in, and I'm gonna do three rounds of that, getting slightly heavier every single round until I can't move. And I'll end up doing like seven different bicep exercises and two triceps and six different crunches and leg extensions and all these things. Now those are exercises, especially like that one, it's a great example, a machine leg extension. That's something that is very, very, very rarely on my exercise selection list. But sometimes I do it because, you know what, it, it, I have the need for variation. It feels fun, uh, I can focus on some different things. And you know, every once in a while, every couple of months, it, it's important to change up your exercise selection. So sometimes I will change up those things if only for the mental break or, or the excitement of variation. We used to do this in college. Uh, I played college football. And one day a year, usually towards the end of the season, we're in playoff season. It's been seven, uh, it was probably more like 10, 11, 12, 13 weeks of training. I played uh, in Oregon, so it was cold and rainy out. You're tired. You're beat up. You don't really want to be there anymore. And usually when the morale would just get to the very bottom of the team, the coaches would say, okay, it's reverse practice. And everyone would get so excited. And what that meant is the offense played defense all day and the defense played offense all day. So I was a defensive back. So when we got the one-on-one -on -one drills, I got to be the wide receiver. And I got to burn those crappy receivers that are trying to guard me, play defense on me, right, catch balls. Uh, we got to throw the passes as a quarterback. We got to run the plays on offense. Right? Now, and this is a pretty high level, right? College, we, we were very, very good in college. But it was simply once a year, we needed the mental break. We needed some variation. We did a bunch of movements we weren't used to, right? Because we had spent seven or eight months doing the same footwork drills every day. The same, 80% of practice was the exact same. So sometimes the need for variation in and of itself is enough to change your exercise selection. Okay. Our last one here is simply ideal versus realistic. I kind of mentioned some similar things with point number five, injury status. But you're always going to walk into your program when you have your athletes or your clients 
and you have a, 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 an idea of what's the most ideal, what's the best case scenario exercise choice. But then you often have to find, face reality. So I mentioned working with combat sport athletes. Right? Ideally, I would love for them to do full barbell snatches from the ground all the way down to the bottom. Realistically, they're in the hurt sport. They get kicked, punched, twisted, joints manipulated in the wrong way every day. It's just not very realistic because the best part about Olympic weightlifting or the best part about like a dumbbell snatch is, or a barbell snatch, is almost every muscle and every joint in your body is working. The downfall of that is every muscle and almost every joint has to work. So if anything hurts, you really can't do it. So be very careful of this. Sometimes, especially for younger coaches or younger trainers, this is really hard because you know what works really good for you. You're 25 years old or 23 years old. You're probably pretty fit and pretty strong. Nothing really hurts. Everything feels fine. And you're working with your clients and you're like, man, why can't you do this? You know, we should only have to deadlift, squat, bench, and maybe do some pull-ups. You should be fine. It just may not be realistic for a 45-year-old man who's never worked out or hasn't trained since he was in high school. It might not be realistic for a 12-year-old girl. Right? So you have to take your abilities, move them out, and, and determine, you know what, this would be ideal. I would love to be able to do this, but here's what's realistic. We might have to do some bicep curls. Uh, that's a good example. So I used to train NFL players getting ready for the NFL Combine, where we eventually had to have our Saturdays. We turned into gun show days. So this would mean they would show up Saturday, and we would pick out like three. Like, uh, hey, you, you, and you. Uh, you pick your favorite bicep curl exercise, you pick yours, and then you pick yours. And then you, you, and you, you pick your favorite tries, try, try. And then it'll be like, all right, what's up? And the first person would pick it and be like, I like to do this one. And then we do as many reps as they can of that one. And the next guy would go and they say as many reps as that one and the next one. That was not any log logic at all with exercise selection. But what we were doing is that was the day that they would come in and we would work on their physical therapy. We would do recovery modalities, stretching, mobility stuff. What we found out is they weren't showing up for those things. So when we gave them those bicep curls and those tricep days, they showed up. That was like a 15-minute thing. We smoked their biceps and triceps, but then we got 45 minutes or an hour in of the important work we needed to do. So ideally, we would not have selected the biceps or the triceps at all, but realistically, it's something we had to do or overcome to get what we needed to get to. Okay, so that's exercise selection. And I wanted to make you mention of a couple of things though as we're going. In another video, what I'm gonna do is give you what I call my top 10 mistakes people make with their exercise selection. So stay tuned for that. I'll also throw up a 55 minute fizz and go check out the five minute fizz if you haven't done that. If you got any questions, let me know. Uh, social media at Dr. Andy Galpin or on the website andygalpin.com. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for helping me spread the word and we'll see you next time.